Hi everyone, my name is Danny Kirsch. I'm a PhD candidate in integrative biology at Oklahoma State University, as well as a GRA at the Research and Learning Services Department at the library. And today I'll be talking to you about file naming, folder organization, and FAIR data. So kind of an outline of how things are gonna to go today. First, I'll give you a brief overview of what FAIR principles are and how they might apply to your data and your research. And then I'll talk through some best practices for folder organization, then for file naming, and then I'll talk about how to fix some bad habits you may have developed for both of those. And for those who want to access the slides for future use, at the bottom of each of my PowerPoint slides, there will be a URL here linking you to an OSF page that will link you directly to this presentation so you can download it and access any of the links and other information. All right, so for those who aren't familiar, FAIR itself is an acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so these are principles that we want to apply to our research data um, to make it more open and available and usable by our fellow researchers. So if you're not familiar with this concept, um, just a few examples of how FAIR data can actually fit into your own research. So for one thing, it will fit well um, if, you, if you work on a collaborative research team with a bunch of other, whether it's um, PIs, co-PIs, graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates, uh, if you're working on a collaborative team, following these sorts of principles to make your data more easily understandable, more easily accessible, can make these collaborations go more smoothly and more efficiently. Additionally, we're starting to see a push from a lot of funding agencies, particularly at the federal level, uh, for people having clearly written data management and sharing plans. And a lot of the principles that go into FAIR data are also good practices to put into a data management and sharing plan. We're also seeing this from the opposite side, the publisher uh, journal side of research, where they're wanting to see that your data remain accessible, that they're made open to the public and other researchers. Um, and so again, these principles fit well with a lot of those requirements that people are starting to see as they go to get their articles published. It's also good for your own sanity and productivity. So if you're uh, having a more a cleaner workflow and uh, more effective data management, it's going to make your life a lot easier working on your own research. And looking beyond your current project and the scope of your current data collection, FAIR principles can also help data find a life sort of beyond what you're working on it as the original researchers. So starting with the F in FAIR, which as a reminder stands for findable, here are a few good things to keep in mind. Uh, if you're wanting to start following these principles, here's some good things to think about to make your data more findable. So including descriptive metadata with your data itself is a really good way to allow others to find your data once it's been placed somewhere where it's openly accessible to others. So individuals who are searching around trying to find data that actually fits descriptions and the content of your own data, if you have descriptive metadata, it makes it easier for those people to come across your data and reuse it and give you credit for these data that you've collected. Also ensuring that both your metadata and any other data have unique persistent identifiers like BOIs. It gives them a permanent spot online so people will, will not have to worry about contacting you or navigating to a particular file directory, they'll just be able to find it online at this persistent URL and download it and use it as they please. And so a lot of times when you're using particular data repositories, those will assign your data, your metadata with DOIs. Um, but if for some reason your data repository does not, or you have an earlier need for a DOI for your data, there are some organizations and sites like, uh, for instance, Data Site, C-I-T-E. Um, among many other services they offer, they can also create DOIs for your data. So something to check out if, if that's a need that arises in your project. 
And then finally, making sure that your metadata exists in a searchable resource. So a lot of times this is going to be something like a data repository where people will be going anyway to search for these particular types of data sets and um, you want them to encounter that metadata so that they um, pursue your research beyond that. Next, we have uh, A for accessible. And so we want our data to be free and open access. So not behind a paywall, not under some kind of subscription fee. People should be able to access it at no cost from anywhere in the world. And it's also important to make sure that even if you think your data over time uh, might no longer be able to be supported and saved in whatever storage system you're using or whatever data repository can only guarantee storage for X number of years, making sure that your metadata are in some place where they will remain accessible beyond that point will still make your project, your data, your research very useful and usable by others in the future. Because there's still, if you have well-written metadata, there's still a lot of very important information that people can glean from that, even in the absence of your data files themselves. And for those of you who work with protected and private data, and you're concerned about this free and open access aspect, you can still make those types of sensitive data accessible without putting yourself or participants or people's personal information um, at risk. And so there are data repositories that are more designed for this type of sensitive data. And some of the practices that they often have in place is having prospective users get authenticated before they can even start trying to access the data to make sure that these people are who they say they are, they're affiliated with who they say they're affiliated with. And then you also make sure that your data have very specific data use agreements that these users will agree to. So you have complete control over the extent to which people can actually utilize and reuse your protected and private data. Then we have interoperable. So we want our data to be machine readable. And in a lot of instances nowadays, this is becoming a little easier because a lot of inputs and um, data are already going online. They're going on applications like different spreadsheets or text files, um, that sort of thing that, that tend to be more easily machine readable. But something to keep in mind for those of you like myself who are still very much in the handwriting area of taking down data, if you have physical data sheets where you're writing down observations or you're recording dates or sample numbers, it's not sufficient to just scan those documents, those handwritten documents and upload them and count that as having interoperable and accessible data because not everyone can read your handwriting and machines certainly, I shouldn't say certainly, most likely will not be able to completely accurately read your handwriting. So it may be necessary in those instances to carefully transcribe your handwriting to a digital form so that you have a digital record that's more machine readable and uh, not tied to someone's ability to read your handwritten uh, language. We're, it's also very important to have open file formats. So we don't want to use as much as possible. We want to avoid the use of proprietary file formats. So for instance, files with the extension dot xlsx or dot docs, um, the sorts of documents we think about generating from Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word. Those are great if you have those applications, but xlsx files and docs files are not able to be opened um, without those Microsoft Office products. So instead of those sort of things, it's better to use open file formats that can be accessed using free and open softwares. So file types like CSV files, PNG files, PDFs, where again, anyone, anywhere can access and utilize these files that you've generated. It's also important to use standard vocabulary and formatting. And um, if you are concerned that your lab or your working group might use 
different abbreviations or that you just have very unique codes in your data, just make a data dictionary. So um, essentially what a data, data dictionary does is it allows you to define different objects in your data set, describe any abbreviations or codes that you may be using or certain properties of elements of your data so that someone who's looking at your spreadsheet or your data set can then use this data dictionary to help them interpret exactly what these different codes and abbreviations and terms mean in the context of your data. It's also very important to make sure your data sets are properly cited and linked to relevant metadata or other data. So if your project has multiple elements that are saved in multiple locations, even if they all have DOIs, make sure that it's clear where these different elements link, how they're related to one another. So if someone wants to use the entirety of that project, they don't have to go hunting around the internet trying to find all the different data sets and files and metadata um, that it's all in one place, very clearly stated with citations and links. And then finally, we have reusable. So I've mentioned metadata a number of times now in talking about these FAIR principles, and I'll reinforce it again. Having detailed metadata will make you so much more compliant with these FAIR principles. Because again, the more information people can gain from your project from this metadata file makes it easier for them to reuse it because it's more clear what you've done in the experiment, how you've generated the data, when you've generated the data, what kinds of data you've generated. So having detailed metadata is very important. It's an excellent habit to get into. It's also good to make sure that both your metadata and your data meet domain relevant community standards. And so what we mean by that is, um, and you can find some of these general standards online if you search around in whatever research discipline you're in. But this is basically trying to encourage researchers to put their data files together in a way so that if someone comes by down the line and wants to use your data and another group's data and another group's data, maybe they're doing a meta-analysis, maybe they're doing a review, and um, if everyone is following these general community standards for whatever discipline you're in, the people using the data down the line won't have to spend days, weeks, months reformatting data, reconfiguring vocabulary or terminology, converting proprietary file formats to non-proprietary file formats. And so it can smooth that process out and make it a lot easier for people to use your data and get you more credit for your data being utilized again and again. Also make sure it's clear where the data came from and how to, how to cite or acknowledge owners. So we wanna make sure that the people who are using our data are confident in how those data were collected, where they came from, and that they can give proper attribution to the original collectors so that people are getting credit for data that they've generated being utilized again in future studies. And kind of along with that, make sure that you have clear data usage terms and licensing. We want people who are using our data for whatever projects or analyses down the road to be confident that they're using our data in the way that we intended it to be used. So kind of along with FAIR principles, and I'd mentioned this very briefly at the beginning, um, this has become more and more prominent as the years have gone by, but data management and sharing plans are also a great way to get off to a good start with meeting these FAIR principles. And these are becoming more and more often required by certain federal funding agencies. Um, for instance, earlier this year, NIH just updated their data management and sharing plan requirements. And quite a few federal agencies are currently in the process of developing and updating their own requirements. And aside from that, even if you aren't using federal funding or your particular funding agency is not requiring these data management and sharing plans, it's generally recommended for all researchers. And it really helps promote early and sustained compliance with FAIR data principles. So if you're not super familiar with these, 
Um, in a nutshell, data management and sharing plans first get you to describe the data that you're going to be acquiring or generating during a particular project. And then once you've sort of laid out the types of data that will be collected, you're then supposed to describe how you're going to manage the data, how you will analyze the data, store, share, preserve it for future use. So a lot of these fit in really well with these FAIR principles that I've already talked about. And so if you have this plan at the very beginning of your project, even if you're updating it as the project goes along, it's going to set you off um, with much better and consistent compliance with all of these requirements and, and principles. And if this is something that you're needing to start putting together, either because you think it's a good idea or it's a requirement for your particular funding agency, if you don't really know how to get started, I would encourage you to check out DMP tool. They not only have a pretty robust list of funder requirements, but they also have some really nice templates and example data management and sharing plans to give you an idea of how your data management and sharing plan will ultimately end up looking and what sorts of content belong in a data management and sharing plan. And so if you download the slides, uh, I've included a link to DMP tool, but you can also just search DMP tool in a browser and it will pull it up as well. All right, so now that we're done with FAIR principles and data management and sharing plans, the rest of this presentation will focus on file naming and folder organization. So first off, I would imagine, if not for everyone, for most of you, this image on the right looks very familiar. Um, just this chaos of, in this case, people, but maybe in our computer, the chaos of files and folders, while Waldo is perhaps the specific file that you were looking for in this specific instance. And it can feel like quite the treasure hunt sometimes. So I'll start first in this section of the presentation talking about effective folder organization. And this is really nice for two primary reasons. So first of all, you can quickly identify folder contents, which will hopefully reduce the where's Waldo type of file finding. And if you're working on a team in a more collaborative project, having better folder organization will also help streamline the work between you and your collaborators. And so there's three main things I'm gonna focus on um, that I think are worth considering when you're organizing your folders. So first off, avoiding long folder names or complex hierarchies. We do want folder names to indicate contents, but we don't want folder names to be so long that it becomes more of a chore to actually determine what the contents of that folder are than it would be to just click on every folder and see what sort of files are inside. Complex hierarchies are also worth avoiding, excuse me, because you don't necessarily want to have to navigate through six or seven different folders and subfolders and sub subfolders to try and get to the specific data files um, or other files that you need. So if you're thinking about particular names for folders, think about the specific contents of that folder. So for instance, what I've shown here is a data folder. So if I click in my data folder, you might see some CSV files, some image files, maybe some um, video files, depending on the type of data that I'm collecting. Or if I'm doing a lot of field studies, I might decide to have folders based on different locations or different field sites that I'm visiting so I can keep those data grouped by that particular component of my project. Now, when it comes to top level directory naming or like your overall project folder, in that case, it's okay to be a little bit more descriptive. Uh, you might include a project title, maybe even a unique identifier and probably a date or at least the year uh, associated with that project. So the example I've shown here is a pretend USGS grant that I got in 2022. And so everything under this top level folder would be related to that USGS project. Next, we want our folders to represent particular categories or attributes. And so if you end up using 
a few levels of subdirectories, you want to try and split them by a common theme and include the same information or at least the same order of information as you progress through those subfolders. So the example that I've got on the right of a pretend folder hierarchy for this pretend project is I've got my top level project folder. And then let's say I'm the PI on an Oklahoma field team and there's a co-PI down in Texas working on the same project. So maybe we decide we want to split our subdirectories by location. So there's an Oklahoma folder and a Texas folder. And then within those is where each individual team is putting data files. So CSV files, image files like PNGs, uh, maybe we put our code in there, any Python or R script, and that would be reflected as well from the Texas team. Now that's not to say this is the only way that this type of project could be organized. And it's really going to come down to your preference or your team's preference as to what folder organization system makes the most sense to you and works the most smoothly. So there's really no one right way to do it. It's just important to do it with intention. And then finally, once you have sort of a more laid out file directory structure, it's very important to document it. And most likely when you're in the midst of a project, you'll end up documenting that as part of a readme file. And if you're not familiar with readme files, this is one of the most common forms that metadata takes. And so um, this readme file will have essentially data about your data or data about your project. And its primary role is to make sure that anyone who is using this readme file and looking at all of the components of your project is able to correctly understand and interpret your data. And this is good not only for others down the road who might be reusing your data, but it can also be important for you. If you step away from your project for a few months or a few years, the readme file is going to help get you back up to speed about where things are and what they mean. And so what I've got here in this manila box is just an example of the beginning of a uh, metadata template that, or readme file template that I, I've used before. And so this is just the general information portion where you put like a project title and then some contact information for some of the lead investigators. And I won't go through this in this presentation, but again, if you're using, if you've downloaded the slides from the link available on the slides, um, there's a really nice readme template provided by Cornell University that's very comprehensive and is a really good starting point if you're wanting to start writing readme files for your projects, but you don't really know where to get started. And it's very easy to adapt the sections and include what you need for your project, get rid of what you don't, elaborate where necessary. So again, in this manila box is just an example from that template for the data and file portion of a readme file. So it's encouraging to list all your files or folders contained with the data set or project, including a brief description, describing any relationships between the files. So it's really a very comprehensive overview of your entire project. All right, so moving on to file naming. Um, again, just a few plugs for why it's important to intentionally and informatively name files. For one, it can help you more easily sort them. You can also quickly identify the file contents. I don't know how many times I've had to click on a couple dozen files in a row just to try and find the particular file I was looking for because I named it poorly. Again, it will help streamline collaborative projects because it's gonna be easier for everyone to know what's contained in particular files and where to find particular files. Um, and by naming your files more intentionally, you can also reduce your need for a more complicated folder hierarchy. So instead of having to navigate through several different subdirectories, you might just need to scan through your file names. And so there's six primary things that I'm going to walk through um, to just to think about if you're wanting to get started naming your files more informatively. So this first one might seem kind of obvious, 
having unique file names. I'm sure we've all seen these alert messages on the right talking about, uh, hey, warning, you already have a file in this folder with this name. Are you sure you want to replace it or would you like to rename it? Um, and so our computers do a pretty good job of keeping us from doing this when we're working in a single folder, but it doesn't necessarily keep track of uh, if we have the same file name in different folders. And even if you're in your project, you originally start with files in different folders, you never know when those files might get moved around, when those folders might get combined. And on the off chance that your computer doesn't catch that you have things with the same name, you would hate to have one of your very important data files get deleted or replaced by something else because there was a conflict where they shared the same name. Length of file name is also important to keep in mind. So we want to strike a balance between too short of a name that borders on uninformative and too long of a name that might become difficult to read or might even cause problems when we try and share the file or open it with certain applications. And so the general range of recommendations that I saw while researching for this presentation was from about 25 to 50 characters in length. And something you can do to help cut down on this is to use abbreviations or codes to save space. So for instance, if you're working with financial data, you've got a second quarter report, instead of writing second quarter, you might choose to abbreviate that as Q2. Or if you're working on a bunch of uh, chemical experiments and you're doing some mass spectrometry, instead of typing out mass spectrometry, you choose to abbreviate that as MS. Just make sure if you are choosing to use abbreviations or codes in your file names, make sure you're documenting them somewhere. They may make complete sense to you right now, but two months down the road, you may completely forget what MS stands for or what Q2 stands for. And then again, you're going to be going back through having to click on individual files to figure out what the contents are. Next, uh, think about what characters we can and can't use. And I will say that at least in some instances with the don't use these, um, a lot of the improvements in our computers nowadays will make some of these concerns obsolete. But in case you are using older operating systems, <coughs> excuse me again, or um, older programs, it's a good idea to still just err on the side of caution and try and avoid using those um, particular characters in your file names. So what is safe and what you can focus on are alphanumeric characters like letters and numbers, as well as hyphens and underscores. So if your file names just contain those types of characters, you should be totally fine. Generally, you want to try and avoid spaces in your file name. That's mainly because you can have some issues either if you're running bits of code in command line or if you're using certain programs that might not be able to deal with spaces within a file name. They might treat it like uh, moving on to a new portion of the code rather than as one single unit. So that's why we would then use hyphens or underscores instead of spaces. You also want to avoid special characters. And this is just a sampling of special characters. And a lot of times applications will warn you and prohibit you from saving a file using one of these special characters. Uh, but some might let you get away with it. And it's generally good to avoid them because not all systems and not all programs can handle these sorts of special characters because a lot of times they have alternate functions that they serve um, at the deeper computer level, where if it's in a file name, it can cause all kinds of problems. And then finally, we also want to avoid periods. And the main reason for that is because the period is generally um, considered the, the break between your actual file name and the file extension. So .pdf, um, .xlsx. And if you're putting periods elsewhere in the file name, again, that can sometimes cause problems. <clears throat> 
For formatting, um, if you do have words or phrases that you want to include in your file name, but you don't, you're obviously trying to avoid using spaces, you can combine words using hyphens or camel case. And if you're not familiar with camel case, this is a formatting choice wherein you capitalize the first letter of each word. So the way that I formatted Lion Genome Project here is each word is distinguished by a capital letter. Now, if you do have a lot of abbreviations or codes that are a little more difficult to separate using capital and lowercase, you might choose to use hyphens instead. So in this top example, NIH FXS grant, if I didn't have this hyphen here, it would just look like one long meaningless abbreviation. So the hyphen helps me delineate these particular elements of my file name. If you're using dates in your file name, it's generally a good practice to use the international standard where you start with the largest chunk of time and progress to the smallest chunk of time. So um, for most files, that's just going to be year, month, and day. So you would list the year first, followed by a two-digit month, followed by a two-digit day. And it's really your choice or not if you want to separate those elements with a hyphen or not. If you're doing running some sequences, whether it's different runs of an experiment or any other kind of sequence in your files, make sure you're using leading zeros. So all of those numbers have the same number of digits. Otherwise, if you go to try and sort by those numerical values, your computer will make some decisions behind the scenes that don't make a lot of sense to us as people. But the ultimate outcome is that it will not sort from one to say 100. It will, some of the numbers will get shifted around if they don't all have a matching number of digits. So leading zeros are important. Then for this portion, I'm not going to go through every single bullet point. This is just a list of common um, project components that I saw come up as recommendations to include in file names. The exact components that make sense for you to include are going to vary quite a bit depending on the type of file that you're using or your particular needs for the project. And so just as an example here, I've got a pretend file name that I might use for one of my projects. And so I opted to start with creation date. In this pretend scenario, I'm planning on having a lot of similar files like this generated. And it's important to me to be able to distinguish between the different dates that these files were created on. So I put that first so I can take advantage of my file sorting to order these chronologically. And so I've got that date formatted year, two digit month, two digit day. I've separated it from the next component with an underscore. And my project ID, I've abbreviated here as reproproj. Again, separated uh, the next element with an underscore. And if this is a collaborative project, it might make sense for me to include my initials. So if someone else creates a similar file on the same day, we can distinguish which file is the one I created and which is the file one of my collaborators created. I might also choose to include the subject matter of this data set. So in this instance, it would be a file with some kind of egg data in it. And then I also opted to include the state of the data. So this is my raw, untransformed data. And over time, I might get a similar file that instead is labeled transformed or cleaned or final. So I can distinguish those different phases of my data. And then finally, version control. So for a lot of different reasons, it might be important to you to include some element of version control in your files. You can opt to include the version number in your file name. So you might use the abbreviation V. So you would have V01 for your first version, V09 for your ninth version, et cetera. Uh, but in many cases, I would recommend using version control systems like Open Science Framework or GitHub instead. Uh, because those have automated version control. And it's not reliant upon you as the researcher to remember first to rename 
a new version of a document um, and also to document the changes that you've made because a lot of these version control systems will prompt you to make comments or can actually track changes in particular file formats. And so version control systems are going to be a lot more automated and guided way of version controlling your files. And so this is just kind of, again, some things to keep in mind when you're naming your files. And there's a really nice worksheet that Kristen Briney from Caltech Library created. And again, I've linked to it on this slide, um, but it will allow you to walk yourself through some different things to consider when naming your files and ultimately allow you to come up with your own file naming convention. And then a few other additional recommendations. So if you're working with a lot of different types of files, different formats, you can use different naming conventions for those different file sets. So the things that you may need to name your R script files may be very different than the components that you choose to include for image files or for spreadsheets. And you'll also likely want to arrange your components from general to specific. And um, it can be wise to put important information first. If you know down the road how you're planning on sorting these files, you might choose to put those elements first. So more than likely, this is going to be some type of alphabetical sorting, numerical sorting, or something more chronological like the date. And again, as you come up with these naming conventions, put them in your data management plan, put them in your readme files, share these documents with your collaborators. And so for this last portion here, this is just a bit of a recommendation from my end on some different ways that you might try and start fixing some bad habits that you've developed for file naming and folder organization. And so I've kind of broken them into three different starting points where you might, it might be a good opportunity to start making these changes. So first, if you're on the cusp of starting a new project, this is a really good opportunity to create the habits from the beginning. And so first is going to be just planning. I talked about data management plans earlier. As you're putting together your project plan, think about how you're going to be organizing your folders. Think about how you're going to be naming your files and determine all of this as much as possible before you actually start putting together your experiment, before you start collecting data. Know what types of data you're going to collect. And then as you go along, um, make sure you're documenting your folder organization and file naming schema. Include this in your readme files share it with any collaborators on the project. And then because things will be changing as they always do in research, just make sure that you're updating any changes or additions or subtractions that you make so that everyone can stay up to date with this. Now, if you're already in the middle of a project, but you're conveniently about to start a new phase of your project, whether that's data cleaning, data analysis, writing up an article for publication, this is a good spot to start improving habits. And so first thing you might do is create a file naming scheme or maybe even a folder organization scheme that's relevant for this phase. You don't need to completely rehash your entire project, but just be intentional about how you're going to organize and how you're going to name right now in this part of your project. You might need to do some reorganizing with your folders, um, and it's probably going to be better to create new folders under your improved organizational scheme rather than trying to clean existing folders that already have a mess of bad habits. And if you do end up reusing and renaming files, I would recommend saving copies of those files in your new folders so you can rename them following your naming scheme. It's generally not a good idea to just overwrite existing file names or otherwise alter original files. And again, document these changes as you do them. Make notes of what files you copied, where you copied them to, how you renamed them. So you have a record of all of these changes. So if down the road, you're not sure where something went or what something used to be, you can easily figure that out. And if 
that all seems like too much right now. You can also start very, very small and just practice naming conventions and try out organizational schemes as you generate individual new files. And so if you're currently working on a data set or you're reading a bunch of papers, create a file naming scheme that is relevant for this particular file format and this particular project. And think about whether or not you need to start or create a new folder to put these files in, or if you can just get away with using existing folders, um, but using these naming conventions to make the files more informatively named. And again, document and update these schemes and organizational structures so that you have a record of what you've done and you have a template to go off of as you generate new files and new folders down the road. And so with that, um, I hope this has been an informative presentation. If you are an OSU student, faculty, or staff member, you're welcome to contact this email here if you have further questions or would like to schedule a consultation with us to talk more about research data management or um, file schemes, folder schemes, anything like that. And as a reminder, if you want these slides, they're included at this URL down here. And thank you.